Hello everyone, uh, my name is Maria and today uh, I will be moderating this masterclass. Uh, we will listen to Anja Skrzydło, Martin Dubel and Pedro Silva, uh, who should join me in a second on the screen. Yes, <laughs> uh, who will tell us a bit more uh, about their experience in building Shiny applications. Uh, all of us are working, working in Epsilon and probably uh, if you are watching uh, this conference every day, you had a opportunity to uh, see my colleagues already. Um, and I really encourage you to ask questions in the chat. I will try to ask them after each panel. Um, and we'll start with Anna, who will try to answer a question on how to build user-centric applications. Uh, so I will leave the floor to you, Anna, and Pedro Martin and I will be back soon. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, let me share the presentation. Okay, you should be able to see my presentation. So hello once more, my name is Anja Skrzydło. And today, as Maria said, I will be trying to answer the, the question how to build user-centric applications. But first, let me ask you a question. So why, why we even want to build <laughs> user-centric applications? So why our applications need users? If you can type your answer in the comments, uh, Maybe this is the first time you you are asked such a question. So I think it's a good to take a minute and, and think about it. So I'm waiting for your comments. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. <laughs> for money, this is. Also, a great answer <laughs> for fame to do something. I build apps to try uh, to try answer people's questions. Great, solving a problem for someone exactly. If they yeah, if people don't have questions, they basically don't don't need the app. Yeah, another answer to help people also great. Yeah, so how I would summarize that is to actually, we build apps so that they have some impact in the world, right? So uh, we want to build up to help someone, you know, do their job, to do that job faster or more efficiently with less errors. Uh, we build games sometimes to just entertain people. So again, to, to, to have some impact on, on other people on the world. So this is exactly the reason why we need users. And so we also want to build user-centric applications. And then who should take care about that users, who should make sure that the app we are building is actually uh, built around the user. And maybe many of you will answer, let me change the slide, UX designer, right? This is the, like, the sense of job of UX designer, right? To think about the interaction uh, between the user and the application. This is of course correct. Another person, business analyst. Yes, this is the person that uh, analyzes the, the user's needs and tries to translate that needs into technical requirements. That's also a um, great, great answer. I hope you also uh, would mention product owner because this is the person responsible for the success of the whole application, right? And if the success of the application uh, is to, so, so that people just use that app, then of course product owner needs to know uh, the users a lot and just take care about them. And I would also add here developer because this is the person that at the end of the day makes that decision how to implement uh, a feature. So of course also should be aware of the users of their needs and just um, think about them when, when developing. So basically, what I want to say here is that each and every person in the team should actually care about the users. And it's not a job of a specific role. So even if you don't have UX designer, for example, in your team, it's perfectly fine. And you can still build user-centric applications. And this is what I would like to encourage you today. OK, so the three pillars that I want to talk about today of user-centric applications are prototype, test, and measure. And this is also the agenda for today's presentation because I will be going through them one by one, explaining you uh, how to do that, uh, why it's important, and uh, 
yeah, and and I hope that in the end will build you the whole picture how to how to build user centric applications. Okay, so let's start prototype. So prototyping by prototype I mean just a rudimentary model of a working application, right? That can be used to demonstrate either the purpose of the whole application or just uh, one of the functionalities. And what's very important. You, you should be able to build a prototype with relatively low cost compared to, of course, building the, the whole app, the whole solution. Uh, so what's important here is that you start uh, prototyping using very simple tools, and then you can advance them as you, as you, you know, go further, as you collect more information. Because what's very important at the beginning, especially when you are just building a new app, you don't know a lot about the app yet. You don't know about your users. Uh, barely anything, so then you want to iterate very quickly. So if you use very simple tools that will allow you to create that prototype really very, very quickly, like, for example, pen and paper or even PowerPoint, just to, you know, have some row tables and uh, rectangles and, and as buttons. Uh, if you use such easy tools, uh, it's perfectly fine. It will allow you to iterate very quickly and quickly improve your prototypes. And then, as you already have a better understanding of your users, you can concentrate on more details. Then you can use uh, more advanced tools, more, more dedicated tools like Figma, for example. But this is um, just an example. You can, of course, uh, use any other uh, type of tools. Also, Shiny itself is great for prototyping because uh, we can very easily um, create an app with some um, default um, elements and uh, also like leaving the, the, the server part behind, just putting the uh, UI and uh, trying to show uh, how you understand uh, your, your app, your flow, and uh, give it to the users so that they can also um, check if this is what they actually need. Prototyping interactivity. This is also very important because thanks to that, and what I mean by prototyping interactivity is just having not only flat screens, but also connections between them. Uh, so that you can show using your prototype that if a user clicks this button, this screen appears. And this is very important because only uh, thanks to prototyping it, uh, you can actually see some and very strange behaviors of your of your app, some uh, you know uh, leaks in the user flow, something that uh, makes it um, not very easy to use that app. So you should also prototype that, and you can prototype that even with a pen and, a pen and paper. If you just cut out the elements from the from the you know paper and just put it on a on a, another piece of paper, and uh, you ask someone to, to, you know, click a button and then uh, you can just move around the elements and show what happens next. And it's also okay. Uh, and it also you know, shows uh, the flow through that application. So I encourage you to be creative here uh, and, and also try new, uh, new ways <laughs> how, you can, how you can prototype, how you can show your uh, ideas before actually implementing them. And uh, another point here, it's rather psychological trick, I would say. It's good if you prepare more than one version, because if you prepare only one version, you feel emotionally attached to that. And you will rather try to um, convince others that this version is good. <laughs> uh, but actually, when you, you prototype, you actually want to understand, you want to get information for the future users of the application. So actually, this is completely the other way around, right? Uh, so you don't want to convince others to, to your solution, but you uh, rather want to gather as, as many um, needs, ideas, uh, and opinions as, as you can, so that you can prepare a better product in the end. So remember about that, uh, prepare two, three, maybe four versions. I'm not saying a hundred at one moment because that, that's probably also not possible and not good. But if you stick to one, then you will feel uh, more emotionally attached to that. Okay, let's move to the next pillar, so testing. And by testing here, I don't mean unit tests, performance tests, and other um, that kind of technical tests. They are very, very important. But tests that I mean here are the usability tests. 
And some methods of such testing are, for example, user interviews. I will be talking about them uh, on the next slide, so I will leave it for, uh, for now for, for a few seconds. Uh, another method, hallway tests. So it's when you basically stay on the hallway and ask randomly people to test your application to give you feedback on that application. Uh, it gives a lot of fresh perspective, which is great. On the other hand, if your app is very, very domain specific, uh, it may be just a little bit more difficult, I would say, but still can give you also a uh, interesting insights that, that you can implement in your application. A-B testing, this is when you basically prepare two versions of a UI and just randomly distribute it to people. And then you check the scores. So for example, uh, if this is um, eShop application, you can check uh, the number of uh, su successfully closed transactions and compare between those two, two UIs. Or you can check the average amount of a transaction for version A and B and um, compare. And thanks to that, um, choose the version that just brings uh, better results. What's important during testing? You need to stay objective. So it's, again, a bit uh, similar to prototyping. So you shouldn't try to convince users to, to this solution, or you shouldn't even try to explain them how to use that solution. Because during testing, testing, you are actually, again, gathering information of what may not be working well, what uh, maybe isn't intuitive. So actually, the success of a test is when you gather that information, not when you pass, uh, like do a training for users actually how to use that application. So uh, be concentrated on that, be concentrated on gathering feedback, even if it that, uh, if that will be possible, uh, it may be easier for you if one person prepares, for example, the prototypes and another person leads testing because, because then it's, it's a bit, um, easier to, to stay objective and not try to uh, convince users to, to our solutions. And last but not least, um, test all the time. So you shouldn't do testing only at the very beginning of the, um, of the project and then just leave it. <laughs> uh, for sure, you shouldn't uh, wait with testing at the very end of the project and then you test and you have results, but you don't have any budget left, any time left to actually implement that feedback. So you should test all the time to aim to constantly improve um, the user experience, uh, the whole application, and uh, just constantly uh, having that feedback loop and actually implementing the feedback into your application and, and making it better. Okay, so let's now move to user interviews, as I promised, user interviews, because I want to concentrate about uh, on this uh, method, because I think uh, this is the one that um, is like suits a lot of um, application types, so whether it's very domain specific and only there's only a few users that will use that, or maybe your application is uh, for dedicated for very wide audience, you can still use user interviews and that will give you great results. So what is a user interview? It's basically the meeting between the user and you or the person that will uh, you know, lead the test. Uh, and you ask the user to actually test the application, to use the application. So uh, what are some golden rules for that? So you should keep it one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, it's much um, less stressful for the user. If it's on you and the user, for sure, there, sh there, there shouldn't be a boss or the manager of that user just watching that, that person using the app. This is not a good idea. Uh, that person using the app needs to uh, feel safe in that environment to be actually concentrated on the application, on testing that, and uh, not feeling stressed because because the person feels um, that, that it's tested. Um, make uh, this test, this user interview, ideally the first contact with the application. Why? Because uh, then you can get most valuable um, feedback. Uh, if someone already uses the application, uh, that person already knows like you know, where to click, where to go to find certain informations. 
uh, so won't be uh, or may not notice some things that aren't intuitive for, for the person that actually uses that application for the first time. So if, if this is possible, if that will be first contact of the user with the app, that will be ideal. You should prepare. You should prepare your script uh, in advance. So avoid the situation when you just give the app to the person and you say, OK, then test the app now, because the user will have no idea uh, what to do uh, in such situation, how, how to test that. Uh, so you should be uh, prepared with some exact questions, tasks that you will um, ask the user during such an interview. At the beginning of the interview, you should explain the goal, again, to make the person feel safe and comfortable that you test the app, not the user, so that uh, if, if you make it clear for the user, the users will, be, um, will feel more, more encouraged to actually share the feedback with you. Uh, they won't uh, feel uh, that you know if they cannot doing something it's it's their fault uh, because actually this is the goal of the of the user interview right to find those those places in the app where something isn't very intuitive so um, if you if you make um, that interview a safe place for the user that will be much easier uh, for the user to share such information with you um, you should you should ask business questions so Avoid asking questions like, um, OK, please click the blue button here. <laughs> because it's, uh, you know, uh, it's first of all, it's very easy. <laughs> and second, uh, it's not the real task that the user will come to your app. Uh, so you can ask questions like, um, generate the uh, sales report for May, for example. Because this is the actual task that the user has in mind when opening your application. So try to prepare such tasks, questions that, that actually the user can have in real life when, when opening your app. And last but not least, don't help your user. It will be tempting, uh, but try to, if the user cannot perform an action, cannot find a place where to you know, generate that report, then try to encourage the user to explore the application, to uh, just, just so that they can find it themselves. And also while exploring that application, you can ask them to think out loud. So basically to tell you what they expect will happen when they switch that uh, tab or click that button. And that will also give you even more information about um, how users perceive your app and so how uh, perhaps you can improve it in the future. Um, so that's all when it comes to testing. And the third pillar, measure. And what I mean by measure here, it's measuring um, if and how the users uh, are using your application. So if you, so if the users are using, of course, it's the measuring of number of users, uh, of unique users, uh, or number of sessions, for example and how they use it. You can also uh, measure the, I don't know, either button clicks or usage of some specific modules. And this will all give you information, uh, for example, how you can prioritize your future work, because you will see that there are some features that are uh, most often used. So maybe it's worth investing more time into developing that features. But it works also the other way around. So uh, if you have an app and you know that there is a feature that uh, should be used every day because you know that there are people um, needing that for their job, for example, and they aren't using that at all. Uh, it also gives you information that maybe something is wrong there. Maybe they don't know how to use it. Uh, maybe they don't have enough data there, uh, or maybe they just even don't know that it's there and, and they can use it for, for their job. So this also, uh, it's also important information for you, what you can do. Um, next with, with, with that and how you can make sure that uh, they use it. And most important, uh, you want to measure because you want to take action on the results. So if you see that uh, people aren't using your application, uh, then um, you should do something with that. If you want to make your app a success, then uh, this is just a uh, the, the, the measurement and the result of that measurement is actually 
um, you know, um, the starting point. <laughs> so the information that uh, people aren't measure aren't using your app, or uh, maybe there's just um, too few users in your app, like fewer than you would expect, then this is the, the starting point to actually taking action. So that the measurement uh, wouldn't solve the problems, it will just show you that perhaps there are some problems. Maybe they don't know about the app. Maybe they, they, they don't have the link. Maybe they don't have access. Or maybe there are uh, many other reasons that they are just um, not using that. And this is the, um, the place from where you actually start expanding uh, your knowledge about what, why uh, such such things are are happening and what you can do with that. So, what are the tools uh, for measuring user adoption? If your application is deployed in R Studio Connect, uh, then you can use R Studio Connect Server API, uh, and you can fetch your data from there. You will find information uh, there about the user uh, start and end of the session, as far as I remember. Um, so. I would say rather basic information, but the great advantage of that um, is that even if you haven't used the data, uh, they are there. And even if you deploy um, or you start fetching the data today uh, for the app that was deployed some months ago, you will still uh, be able to get all the historical data, which is great. And it also gives you uh, flexibility, I would say, because uh, there are the data. Uh, but you can do with the data whatever you want. You can build your own app to measure the other apps. You can build your custom report to even send you an email, I don't know, every Monday with the results of user adoption if you want. Uh, you can find more um, inspirations, what you can do with the data on the blog post that I linked here. After my presentation, I will send a link to this uh, blog post in a uh, in a comments because I don't want to uh, make a pause now. Uh, but yeah, this is for sure uh, for apps deployed on our Studio Connect. This is the right source of the data. Next tool, Google Analytics. Um, so Google just enables you to track uh, your tools. Uh, and it, it has some more advanced options. So you can uh, track, for example, the clicks of button or how often um, some elements on the page were used. Uh, the disadvantage of that is that you cannot get historical data. So uh, from the time you deploy Google Analytics, from then you, you get the data. Of course, not all companies will allow for Google Analytics. So there's also a um, self-hosted alternative, and that's Matomo. And it has very similar um, functionalities to Google Analytics, uh, but just the data are on your own servers. And uh, another one also interesting tool is Hotjar. And Hotjar allows you basically to record the user session. I mean, like, um, save a video <laughs> of the user using the application. Uh, and it can also produce some heat maps to show you which parts of the application are most often used. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it saves the video. So uh, you can actually watch the videos afterwards. I did that for one of the, for one of the apps. And thanks to that, I found out that it, it wasn't intuitive uh, how to get to the next screen uh, from one of the places in the, in the application. So we can later, uh, we improve that actually later. Uh, so it, it's also a very um, interesting way of uh, kind of testing, I would say, and, and getting that feedback from the users, uh, how they uh, use the application. And last but not least, golden rules for measurement. So. Decide what you want to measure. So uh, if you are interested in number of sessions, if you are interested in number of users, for example, also the frequency um, in which you want to uh, see the data. So for example, uh, if you want to see uh, daily sessions or weekly or maybe even monthly sessions, it's also important because if you expect that your app is used once a month, then probably looking at the daily number of sessions um, is an, won't give you just a lot of information. So then probably switching to monthly sessions uh, will be more suitable. Then you should set a benchmark. So uh, before you even start to measure or before you even uh, look at the data, uh, you should think, 
uh, what, what's the benchmark? So how many users or sessions you actually expect? So if this is um, the app that will be used by your team, for example, and you know that the team has 20 members and you expect that, that each uh, team member should use that app once a day, so once every work day, actually, then you expect 100 sessions weekly. And this is your benchmark. And if you have such a number in your mind or ideally written somewhere, uh, then when you actually look at the results, then you know if, if this is around the benchmark, if it exceeds, maybe uh, the app is even more popular, uh, or maybe only 50% of the users actually uh, have ever used that application. And then based on that, you can go and check uh, why they aren't using that uh, maybe they again don't have access, or maybe the um, app doesn't work as they as they would like. Uh, and there, there are some um, usability, for example, blockers for them. It's also worth thinking about such ben benchmarks in short and long term. Uh, so in the short term is like the state, the current state of the application, and the current state of that user base. So we know what are the functionalities. We know. Um, how many people more or less uh, could use that app uh, and this is the, the the current world but in the long term maybe we want to um, expand the user base maybe we want to roll out to some new regions uh, or maybe we will create some new functionalities which will encourage users to use um, the app just more often so that uh, we will see that also in the number of sessions so it's also good to have that two perspectives, like now and, and in the future, where we aim to be. Next, explore the data. A lot of people in our community have any or some background in uh, analytics. So use that skills. <laughs> Actually, uh, this is also great uh, data set to explore, so the user metrics. And I, for example, had uh, such a situation that when I was looking at the sessions, like weekly sessions, it was around 75, 80 sessions weekly. But then I realized that most of the sessions are very, very short. And I knew that the app needs some time to load. And there is some setting at the very beginning that the user needs to do before they actually see the, the data that the app was um, you know, supposed to deliver. And when I uh, filtered out the, the short sessions under some threshold, I realized that we have about 50% of drop down, of, of dropout like uh, of in, in, the, in that user base, which means that uh, maybe that loading time and that you know, settings at the very beginning uh, were just discouraging um, users to use the app. Uh, so there was, like an issue that, that we could um, address later. So uh, remember to also explore the data and um, try to um, find some interesting insights there and try to get as much information as you can from the data. Then monitor adoption regularly because only then you can take action on the results. So uh, if you just uh, look at the stats, you know, once a year, uh, it, it won't uh, give you enough information so that you can regularly actually uh, take action on the results and so also make sure that um, your app is successful. So I forgot to click here. Um, to summarize, remember about the three pillars of the user-centric apps, so prototyping to understand the users and their needs better, testing to continuously improve the, sol the solution, so your application, and measure to ensure the success of your application. And that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anya. It was great to listen to your talk. I have to say that when you were talking about asking great questions and not uh, inviting management to the meetings, uh, I reminded myself <laughs> about a few situations that I had. Because, you know, always a manager asking people that work with him, you know, you see, I created this beautiful dashboard. Are you going to use it? Like everyone probably would answer yes, of course. So uh, thank you so much for this. And I see that we have some questions on the chat. 
so we have a question from Eric. Um, do you have advice for measuring user interactions within the application itself? I have tried various approaches uh, with creating custom logging, but would be curious if it's uh, if easier solutions are available. And then we have Pedro answered with Google Analytics, but maybe you want to add something. So I'm not sure if I correctly understood the mm -hmm. user interaction. So if it's uh, like how the user actually uses the app, then I would say Hotjar is also uh, great. Then like you want to know um, who is the user. So <laughs> there is some privacy. Uh, but uh, yeah, actually the, watching that videos, it, it's like a great um, learning, especially so. Uh, it's it's kind of similar to uh, user interviews because you see the user actually uh, working it up, but they don't know that someone will watch that, <laughs> which makes uh, actually I, I think the experience a bit more um, natural. You don't know what the user was trying to achieve, so it's not always um, <laughs> like you, you won't always know. Just uh, yeah, but uh, I would say it's it's very interesting to to watch that. Great. I hope Eric answers your questions. I can see that, yeah, this, the question was about the, uh, how the users are spending time in certain, uh, certain model of the application. So probably Hotjar would be a good idea uh, to do this. So I have a few more questions to you. So one uh, I have is, do you have any advice on uh, for running remote user tests? Because right now we are in the situation when, you know, meeting someone is not that easy. Uh, so do you have any experience with that? And what, what would you recommend? Mm, so I would say it's uh, like it has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, disadvantage is that there is no that personal contact. So the person may not be so focused uh, because, you know, things happening at home uh, may, uh, may not always uh, Feel that uh, feel that safe, I would say, and this is very very important. Uh, but on the other hand, you can very uh, well see what that person is trying to do. So uh, you don't need to, you know, just uh, like I don't know, bend over the person to actually see the screen. But it's very easy. You you just see actually the same what the user sees. So advantages and disadvantages. What I would uh, encourage you is to have uh, cameras on. Uh, because then, uh, especially before when you are talking, explaining the goal and so on, uh, it it just helps to build that relation a bit and uh, just uh, yeah feel more comfortable. And generally, I would try to you know keep uh, to the same rules. So keep it one on one. Uh, be prepared. Uh, it it may be. A bit easier for you to uh, to be prepared because you have you can have your notes somewhere also in front of you so you don't need to like, read from the from the uh, piece of paper uh, but but still uh, it's just uh, like the, the the majority of the rules are I would say the same. Great, thanks. Something something that also came to my mind is that uh, at least for me it's sometimes good to record the session. I don't know if this is something that, that, that you usually do because, yeah, it's not that easy when you're alone on the call to catch, you know, every details uh, during the session. Yeah, so it's, uh, I would say it depends because if if the user is, uh, is very stressful, I think recording mm -hmm. that call may add some, uh, some more stress. So I think it's, uh, so of course, if you want to record, just ask the person if, if it's okay to record. Um, and... Uh, yeah, just just try to be human in that situation. I would say <laughs> that that always helps. <laughs> Great. So, last question that I would have is uh, basically how to convince clients to let you talk with the end users. So, this is sometimes a challenge. Uh, so, do you have any advices on on this? Yeah. So, uh, clients can uh, react in a in a various way, uh, and I think the the most challenging is that. Uh, like usually there, there's one person on the client side that is uh, responsible for the application. Uh, and that person, for example, would like to be uh, there during that calls. And this is not um, this is not good, actually. So uh, even if this is not the, the, the boss of the user, then still having yep. a third person there, uh, I would say, isn't, isn't helping the process. Um, you can try to uh, either prepare the script with uh, that uh, with mm -hmm. that 
person from the client so that uh, it's also good because uh, it will allow you to prepare better business questions and actually ask the questions in the language that they use every day. Uh, you can uh, run a first user interview on that person that uh, that you are trying to convince also to it will be again good for you because you will practice uh, you may improve your uh, your questions then uh, and uh, also that 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 person from the client side from the client side will, will also know how it looks looks like know what maybe users it, it's good to have you for for such sessions and so on um and yeah, I, I was thinking about one more thing, but I just <laughs> forgot. <laughs> I will stop here. It's okay. I still think it was it was a great 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 advice. Uh, so thank you so much, Anya. Uh, right now, I would like to invite you for a five minutes break, and we will continue with presentation from March. Welcome back to the short break. Uh, now we'll listen from uh, Martin, who is one of the most experienced developers in Epsilon, and he will tell us uh, about how to build shiny testing architecture. Yes. Hello. Thank you, Maria, for this uh, really nice introduction. And uh, yeah, thank you all that decided to join this session. I hope that I won't disappoint you. Sharing my screen. Let's wait a second for this to appear. Yeah, so the topic is testing our shiny application. And yeah, probably the, um, the key takeaway uh, from this conference is that you should use mod modules. And also the second one is that uh, we should all join the online racing league and I'm counting on you, Absilonians here. Uh, but also we mentioned a few times uh, during different talks how tests are important. Um, I especially remember uh, that the topic was a little bit um, discussed during the panel with uh, Shiny Contest Grand Prize winner. And they were asked like how many tests there are in their application and they confirmed that yeah, tests are important and then they have none in their Shiny Contest submissions. Uh, so yeah, so uh, during this uh, this talk, this hour, we will try to kind of like gather of what is going on with those tests, what is the current status of the shiny world, uh, the different approaches, different aspects of tests, like what we can test and what are the solutions there and, and our approach and we'll maybe share some mm, not uh, standard uh, lessons and solutions. Um, so yeah, let's uh, dive into the topic. Okay, so uh, there are probably two different sectors when we are talking about tests. So one thing are the packages, and m many of you are actually like creating or contributing to some R packages, and there the tests are kind of like obvious thing, and and you you just have to have to uh, have them. Also, there are some like big applications that you, um, uh, some internal ones, especially I, I know them from uh, pharmaceutical companies that this is something that you actually like develop for, for years. This is like a big project. And usually it is like well known that uh, this is this is really important topic and they are also like well tested. And there is also like typical shiny consulting when uh, we in Epsilon, we handle a lot. Uh, that we are building shiny applications for uh, what is client requesting. And we always say tests are important. Uh, this is like what you what we always hear. And um, client is kind of like more focused on the features. And it's obvious. And we have those situations uh, we sometimes hear why, like directly, please do not do any tests. Uh, we want you to focus on the features because uh, we want to make this uh, like great impression on some management and things like this. Um, so yeah, we are creating great applications or maybe you you know, maybe from your experience, you've also created some applications and then there is a problem that actually those tests are, are useful. And later on, uh, there are situations when you um, when you would like that they are there from the very beginning. So in Epsilon, we uh, we encourage and we highlight this message that tests are important. So like back to point one. And, and 
this is the most important slide of the presentation. So I put it on the beginning so that uh, you can skip the rest. Um, so start with the project with the testing architecture to be there in place uh, when you are doing the job. Because later it might be difficult to actually implement them, difficult mostly from the lack of time. And, and when you are starting with, and this is already there, you might have some time or like sneak sneak uh, and uh, do some tests like during uh, working on the on the features for the client so that they won't even notice and you will have tests and the client will be happy um also the second point is make sure that the tests are triggered automatically i mean uh, i've seen a lot of like great tests that were like not triggered at all and they were kind of like useless and after a month or two of actually developing application, but without triggering any tests, uh, you actually run them. And okay, th th that was like not synchronized at all. It wasn't working. So let's give up on tests because let's continue working on the application. So without this, it's kind of like useless. Um, so yeah, this is the most important topic. So we will get back to this later, but first, let's maybe uh, like recap what we actually mean when we are talking about this test so during this talk we will uh, draw a map of the like test uh, universum that you can have in the shiny applications and this will present like some some of them definitely there are more topics i bet that on comments you can like uh, mention like more more and more of them so there is a topic of the unit test that's a that's a big one and we will focus probably like um most of the time here on the on the unit test so uh, it's like big as asia and uh, there are the performance tests uh, we will will discuss a little bit reactivity which is kind of like specific uh, to shiny and uh, there is some some approach that you need to uh, to implement to test this it's not super complicated um, but you need to know how to do this uh, there are front-end tests, uh, so we did. it was a little bit discussed during this conference, so we will like recap uh, what is there available. Data, I'm not sure if data was covered, uh, but this, I think this is, this is really important. This is sometimes a game changer for the shiny projects. Um, you can test code styling. Actually, I had to come up some, for something for Australia. Uh, there will be bonus uh, one hint for uh, object uh, oriented programming. I think it's too many O's. Um, and after David's uh, presentation, I just quickly added this monkey. I, I thought that we are all amazed with this uh, monkey approach of testing of the app crashing. Uh, I'm not covering it here, but uh, this is also something that is there also there will you might think about like security testing for the shiny applications uh, crucial uh, i'm not an expert here so i i won't cover this but definitely something to to have in mind uh, probably as i said different things that you can test uh, and um, you might know better than me uh, what you can do here okay so this is uh, this is basically our universum of tests and we would like to go one by one and try to find what is the current state for like 2022, uh, what you can do uh, here in those um, areas. New solutions are coming uh, coming in, so probably this presentation won't be uh, like fresh for long, but at least it is what we have now. Okay, so let's maybe before we go into all those solutions, let's answer like the question, why do we need tests? Um, as you mentioned, uh, this is the topic that if you ask someone as a developer, uh, you will always get the answer that tests are important. Uh, but later, like in practice, it's maybe not always they are um, they are so um, main part of the application of your work that you are doing. But the applications are working; they are they are fine. Like we saw, and you probably saw also, like multiple examples of apps that were not tested at all but they were like meeting the user expectations it was everything fine with them so why do we do we need we need tests uh to add five correctly that's one of the answers that i like and this is actually 
the example from the project that we did for one of the, our clients. And they actually had a lot of tests and it was perfect. Um, they did not uh, test uh, one function that was, um, it was doing like much more than adding five. So this is the simplified version. So instead of X, there was like some um, business logic that was like kind of complicated business logic. But uh, then the uh, last line, uh, they did probably someone that during some refactoring of the code, uh, hit and enter in the wrong place. And so there are like the three versions of how you can uh, write X plus five and two are kind of like correct. And the last one is always returning five. And that was the case that was actually happening in that uh, project. And that was a production running application. The function that was uh, having this this issue was not um, not crucial, and it wasn't spotted. And as I said, probably like earlier when they do some like manual testing, it was working fine. But later, after someone touched that function, um, like they thought that like having plus in that line or in that line, it's it's, it's basically the same. So it's x plus five. And uh, one of our like uh, first uh, step when we joined this project was to actually uh, clean the tests and add them and improve them. Uh, as I said, there were many of them, but uh, that was exactly um, the issue with like not uh, running tests automatically. Uh, and they were kind of like forbidden. There was a lot of mess. And we spotted that case uh, that um, basically the function was always returning the same thing that was in the in the last line because of how it was uh, structured that the enter was hit in the wrong place. So you may think um, this as a as a reason for writing tests is a good enough for me. If you are not convinced, we will go to the uh, more like advanced unit test idea. Sorry for this, but I I promise that this is the only and the last one, ma'am in this presentation. Um, so we will try to, to change this guy's uh, mind and actually uh, discuss why the unit tests for Shiny applications are useful. So the conversation with him might look like this, uh, that click through the app, everything works, yes. And this is basically like uh, what we want uh, in our applications that it works when you're clicking not like what's happening underneath. You cannot be sure like that you clicked every scenario and what is there, it's uh, not, um, it's it's everything covered, but actually you cannot be with the test as well. Um, app is simple, but uh, this is like what we um, hear a lot that uh, it does not require tests at the early stage because the app is simple. Okay, we will maybe introduce them later, but it's not needed but the apps are growing really fast and they're like it's escalating quickly. Uh, you might use other meme, but I won't. Um, so yeah, that's probably that you experience as well, that uh, the applications in their like complexity, it's growing really, really fast. And you want, um, when you want add tests at the beginning, it will be really hard to add them later. Um, and, you don't want to click through uh, through your application, even if this is small. Uh, every time that you change your code, uh, your code, you would like that this is somehow automated and covered by the test. Well, the response might be, and it's hard to disagree. And this is actually good if you if you can introduce front end tests. Perfect, um, and and not only uh, unit tests. Um, okay, uh, the logic in the package that you are using might uh, be modified. So even if you, you are not touching your code, you're not maintaining this, if you are updating your packages, it might cause you problems. It might cause you some unexpected behavior that you would like to capture in the test, not like in the production. Definitely, I think it was uh, already uh, covered during this confer uh, conference, uh, use RENF, uh, but Ultimately, like even if you want, would like to keep your uh, environment stable, um, 
there will be some new feature introduced in one of the packages that you would really like to use and you will update the package and again you don't want to click through every time in your application if you have the front end test that's cool but there is one more argument that i would like to highlight because i don't feel this is like um it's having like enough um coverage in the community that the unit tests are not only to avoid bugs but also to write better code and this might be you may treat this as a um, main purpose of you writing tests even like for yourself even when you are starting uh, your own small application or when you are starting the proof of concept that you um, you do it correctly and I think that uh, yesterday I mentioned how important it is to uh, write your applications with a good code quality and yeah blame on me that in my uh, shiny contest submission there were non test but still um, you can uh, do what I say not what I do and I encourage you and uh, next time I will try to uh, be better and actually write my tests because it is uh, good um, good practice. So uh, what the uh, unit tests are helping us with, uh, so they allow you to think carefully what your function is doing and especially how you would like that the function is behaving when something unexpected is happening uh, with the inputs. Uh, find all the edge cases uh, so again uh, we especially with uh, shiny applications when there is some user input and especially if user is uploading some uh, some data sets some files um, there might be like a lot of cases that you would like uh, to catch and you would like to um, plan how the application will behave so the the worst thing that can happen in your application it's like crash and disconnected without any any message for the user of what's going on there okay it will help you to simplify the logic so um probably you already know that like having a massive long functions it's a uh, bad practice and it's not helping you to maintain the code to to actually develop it um, better so once you actually start working on the functions uh, it will be clear for you okay I need to um, split this massive one function into smaller ones so that I can actually test it one by one. And um, maybe something will be redundant. Uh, it, uh, it helps you uh, to write better and simpler code that has um, a single, um, single goal in mind for each function. Um, yeah, it clarify the logic for reader and document the intent of the function. So you can treat your unit test as a way of documenting your code of course like some written documentation is, is really useful but if this is like not clear how function should behave in some cases and um, for the maintainer later of uh, of that package of yours or maybe of your application then like going through the test might actually help you okay like in that case if this is the input we see what is expected uh, and that it was intentional uh, because of, of course like we can we can provide this input and see what is returned but we cannot be sure okay if this is what the original author and the original author might be like yourself a month ago and you've already forgotten uh, but you see the the intention okay that that is tested that case is tested and this is like this is expected and this is what the function should do uh, so it really really helps to make the code uh, much more readable Mm, make the function independent it's connected with simplifying the logic and uh, i think you you all had the, this this experience uh, that maybe you write, wrote uh, one uh, big solution and then you realize okay but i would actually would would like to reuse but only the part of the function like somewhere from the middle and now okay it's complicated you need to refactor takes it somehow somewhere somehow out usually you are like redoing uh, your function and with tests you can spot this earlier and actually write your code at the very beginning that will be better clearer and more reusable independent 
Okay. So uh, there is an example that I would like to go with you of how you can actually spot all of this and write better code. And one disclaimer, of course, those things you can spot without unit tests. And of course, uh, you might see this example and, and say that it's it's obvious. Like you, you would write it like better um, without unit tests like at the very beginning. Uh, it might be true, especially for some experienced uh, developers. Um, it might not be true in each case, and especially for someone who is like starting uh, their adventure with R and Shiny, uh, that might be like a really, really good um, exercise uh, to start coding and writing tests together. Uh, my example, yeah, code refactoring with tests, it's that function. As you can see, it's not the case when this is like a massive one. There's like just five lines in the body, just one argument. And uh, here, like uh, underneath, you have like some, um, uh, so what is actually in the, in this uh, order CSV that is loaded here and the output that is returned and everything is correct with this function. I mean, the, the result is what we are expecting. And now uh, let's say that we put this function, it is working in your Shiny application and it's everything's fine. So even when, if you have like, your front end test, they are returning like everything's good. Like, yes, the total price, maybe this is like some uh, output is displayed correctly. So nothing to actually um, uh, nitpicking uh, here, uh, but we will. <laughs> we will. Uh, once you start your test, you might notice that, okay, I would like to write a test that is actually asking for not column price A, price B, but I would like to see how it will behave if I'm asking for price C. And you will spot like immediately, okay, there is, there is no arguments check like what's provided. There will be like a front error for uh, when I provide price C. And maybe in your application, uh, you would like to actually implement some uh, input that user is typing what column to select and they can provide anything. Uh, they, they can have a typo and your, your function would not cover this. And in your front end test, you are actually always providing the correct values, price A, price A, price A. So that's the first thing. We have a dependency injection later. So there is this read CSV. Probably this is the easiest uh, thing to capture from the very beginning, that this is not something that we would like to have in the function. And uh, when you will write the test, you will probably spot it immediately that, uh, okay, now in my uh, test that file, you need to somehow put a path to this uh, file, but this, might be different than when your Active Directory is, is in Shiny application, and this is causing you some problems. So you don't want to have this as a part of your body. It might be a great example of the, um, of the argument. Uh, also, you will spot that you would like to test how it will behave if there is something else if there is like maybe less columns in your order csv or maybe it is missing the column names or some problems with this file um that might be introduced for example when when the file is updated so you would like to to check it in all the cases okay what's coming up up next uh, there are some magic constants here that uh, no one can set and no one can see what they are about and you actually cannot test if the discount will behave correctly if we modify it. So uh, how it will behave if suddenly we decide or the business logic will be modified that it should be uh, not 20 or 30%, but some other values. You cannot test this earlier. So we will immediately spot this. Later, there is another unclear logic. Uh, what is the 27th of November? Actually, this is a Black Friday, so that's why there is a special discount, but this is like not clear at all. And having the test will provide you this feature of the like self-documentation of the code that I told you earlier. So you might have a test like, uh, let's test that the Black Friday special discount is provided correctly. 
And when you read, read, read through those tests, you actually already see, okay, this is, this is about the Black Friday. So this will help you a lot. And actually this should be extracted to a separate thing. It's about extraction and the single responsibility principle is violated like mostly here. And uh, so we are here doing like a lot of stuff. So inside the one function that is supposed to return you the total price, we're actually loading data. We are selecting a discount also based on what is the day today. And we are uh, selecting the column, multiplying it by discount and also summing up. So a lot of things to do by one small function. And um, if you would like, if this like multiplying is working correctly, maybe something will be wrong here, but it will be really hard for you to spot because there will be error for the whole function. So actually extracting this to a separate function that will be tested separately will help you a lot. Mm, okay. That's the last line. I, I think there is everything fine with return total. Okay. So um, let's move on the like actual implementation of the unit test. And I won't surprise you that the test that package is your your answer for those uh, questions. Uh, when you want to introduce this, I think that there it's not controversial at all. So let's just agree that we will use test that for unit testing. And I think that you know the drill. Uh, so a set of uh, test dates with the, with the names and expects equal. There are a lot of cases, a lot of different expect family functions that you might um, read about uh, uh, more. But uh, yeah, there is like the whole uh, documentation of test that it is like well-known tool. It's well described. It's used uh, everywhere that there are unit tests basically. So I encourage you to go there and see. Uh, I would like to, ah, here it's um, about how to implement them. It's as easy as it is. So there is uh, there is a test that directory um, that is containing your, um, your test scripts. And there is usually a test dot, dot R that is running them. And here it's uh, with uh, use this, uh, there are also like other ways how to include them. We'll cover the, that in the end. And here is like from the package perspective. I think that is copied from the uh, like package uh, test that read me. So this is like the standard way of including them. So if you are only interested in the test that don't worry with the structure, it's already simplified uh, by the community and the, by the uh, use this package, for example. Okay, now. Uh, let me take a sip. Okay, and let's move to some advanced concepts. So yeah, there is this um, main way that you are building your expects, your, your test debt and your expects. The, there might be like different types of those expects, of course, mm, equal the most common. Error is also something that you might find very useful. Mm. Uh, and you, just by like building them and practicing, uh, you will like get familiar and, and get experienced in using this and you will just go and explore other possibilities. Um, two advanced or two and one bonus uh, advanced concept that I would like to, to present to you that you might not uh, be so aware and we find them useful when you are actually building your test. Okay, the first one will be will be mock. So, so mocking some behavior of the other functions that you might have in your functions that you would like to test. So basically here, uh, what it is doing, it's replacing the piece of code to simplify or simulate behavior. And it might be useful in your tests. And usually your functions, especially those functions that are complicated enough that it's worth to be tested. They are using some other functions. So they are like, there is function calling function, they are nested inside. But in order to make sure that when test fails, your your function that you want to test is, is, is actually having problem and not something that is called inside, 
you might want to mock uh, the uh, the inside function that is nested inside uh, and set this to always return the same value and then you know that it will behave correctly when you run the tests okay how this may look in a very like dummy example uh, so let's say we have a simple name function that is pasting uh, system name is and some sysinfo uh, for example linux when i tested this on my mac it's written darwin okay whatever and it is pasting so this is uh, this is our function um, and we would actually would like to test whether this paste is happening correctly our problem is that this info will return different value uh, depending on when you run it so when i run my test locally it might return something else than when for example my ci runs it and so how i should run my test um, also i don't want to be dependent when the something is wrong with the sys info function uh, i i'm here so we might test test sys info like separately but here i would like to write the test for my system name function so this pasting is this is working correctly so i will test that uh, here i will test that base functions can be mocked and i will use the with mock uh, function and i will replace uh, the sysinfo function uh, and i will overwrite what this should be returned the bottom line here is that i'm doing this overwrite only inside this with mock so when we when you go outside it won't cause any problems uh, so here it will always return uh, the system name clever os so whenever wherever you will uh, run your test it will return always the same value great so this gives me the opportunity to actually test my uh, my system name function so this pasting well, in every place on every machine it will behave the same and even if there will be problems and something will break in the sysinfo function uh, i might spot that the sysinfo functions are uh, sysinfo tests for function for that function are failing and not the system name there is everything fine with the system name function okay and so with mock and i'm mocking the sysinfo i can expect equal that the system name and when i run this function system name the return value will be system name is clever os everywhere consistently and uh, yeah let me close the brackets and this is how you might um, use mock to to mock some uh, other behaviors and here um, i'm sure that you will find um, examples in your applications that you are doing in your code when this is like more useful so basically when you are like nesting some behavior and you might want to use it to um, yeah to keep the constant how your nested functions are doing or you might want to actually set this to some value to test some edge cases so it's not it's, it's not always about input it might be about the output from some other function that is triggered inside the function that you would like to test okay so mocking is uh, our our one one topic uh, the other one is is fixtures um, and here what we would like to achieve is that each test should be independent and not affect other tests and uh, by that we mean in your test you might expect to have a lot of like uh repeating yourself so the the dry um rule that you basically would like to follow in your code not necessarily is good for your test because you actually would like to produce a lot of input and reuse the re, re, reproduce them many times the same way even like with, with copy pasting to make sure that uh, each of your test is independent and it's not that uh, you have some like general global object at start of your testing script and it is somehow modified uh, later on and it's that that will affect your other tests uh, down the stream 
Um, also, the other aspect, and here let me click through the sample data creator function. The other topic here is that it's good to, as we will repeat this input for functions. So, for example, here there will be some data that will be repeated and recreated in each test. So we want we don't want to create it once and reuse it in many tests. We want every test to actually create its own instance of the input data, so to make sure that they are independent. Also, we would like to make this kind of like logically, um, to, to incorporate in this fixture the, the logic itself and not the actual values. And that might look a little bit counterintuitive uh, because you might think that it's harder to later test uh what what to expect in your function if you are as here if you're randomly selecting some values um and of course like in r probably there there are no functions like random integer or random numeric maybe in some some package uh, but this is um this is also something that you pre should prepare for all your tests it's some like generator of the content that you need so here, let's assume that we have those random numbers and generators. And then you can separate your uh, thinking uh, from the actual values to the logic itself. Um, you can think about this, let's, let's say that your input is two and two, and your result is four, and you're running your function on two and two and the result is for everything works but actually you may not notice that uh, what is the logic inside is it like adding those numbers is it two plus two or is it two multiple two and it's affecting both of them are uh, returning the same value and your test is fine but if you run this on different numbers uh, it won't be it won't be actually uh, the same so you your logic in your function might be somehow corrupted, but you won't notice this in your test because you are using the same values over and over again. So actually, um, randomizing your data help you to focus on testing the logic uh, without being like, kind of like attached to the same data. And this might also help you to find some edge cases. Uh, we had one example when Mm, like I had that's why I remember this uh, that actually using the random number generator we had the case when two numbers in the vector that we are providing to the function uh, were uh, duplicated so uh, the, the vector was not unique and we kind of like assumed in the function that the vector is having all the unique values and the test failed and we spot okay why that happened because the randomly generated was uh, was not unique and thought okay but that may happen in the application this is the case that we might actually have it's an edge case yes that's why we haven't thought about this earlier but it can happen we need to prepare our uh, function our logic uh, for that case so how you can use this uh, basically yeah there is um a lot of uh, things not defined here, but the concept is basically that you regenerate your sample data in each test. And the, the bottom line here is that you are creating uh, your data in the independently in each test. So that's why you need those generators. Um, as you know, in Epsilon, we like uh, our six classes, so our go-to solution is that we have some class that has the methods that are generating different kinds of the input data that you are expecting in your application. And then uh, you might have this class instance and in each line you might recreate those objects uh, to keep this independent. Okay, those were fixtures. Mm, the bonus from our uh, Antarctica on the map is something that we had to figure out um, some time ago. So maybe to 
um, save your time if you have this example is what to do to test the private methods from R6 classes. Uh, usually in the tests we create a new class that is called, for example, my class tester, and it inherits from the my class uh, that we would like to test. And it has a public method that is exporting all the privates that is inherited from my class. That allows us to then easily use, uh, we create a new instance, of course, in each test to make them DOM independent. And later we can use this get private public method to actually uh, access some private method from the um, from our uh, R6, uh, R6 function. So uh, if you are uh, using uh, R6, and you had this issue of actually, okay, but how I actually, I can test uh, the private functions, the private methods uh, from there um, as the solution you can, you can use. We are, we are using this uh, for our purpose. Okay, we are done with the unit tests. Now the data. From Asia, we move to Europe. There is a data and there is a data validator package uh, here and uh, so that you uh, you get me correctly, this is not the only solution probably. There are many of them out there. Uh, the point here is that the topic is important and how you will achieve this, it's up to you. Um, data validator, yeah, it is some package from Epsilon and uh, it is actually maintained by me, which is maybe not very good for the package, uh, but at least I will promote it. Uh, but um, the point here, yes, uh, the data, checking the data that is coming to your application is not always what you're thinking about when you're building Shiny application. Uh, maybe you are like trusting some API, it's okay. Um, maybe you're trusting the database, that's fine. Actually, uh, you, you, usually the case for using Shiny in the project, it is because there is something wrong with the data and it can get messy and that's why we are having shiny because you can actually fix this kind of like uh, on the go that you are um, doing some like quick deployer and your data that came from the database and it was messy and dirty but then now this is fixed and clean and you can reuse this later on the front end so that's that's where the shiny actually shines and it's um, it's very very useful but yeah, you would like to test this data because if you are getting um, a mess and something like not useful, you can have a perfect front-end test. Everything might be might be there. Uh, you can have a logic that is correct, uh, like 100% test coverage uh, with unit test. The logic is fine, uh, but actually, what you get as a, as your input might be just um, not usable. So that's why you would like to run some automatic and data validation. Here with that package, um, this is based on the assert R, so you might be familiar with that. So this is what you would do with asserter. Um, you are some validating uh, the empty cars and to add the data validator on top of it, you are creating the report and you're adding this the, the, the reports for the, um, for the for the, the that report, um, not sure if it shouldn't be the report, not the validator, but okay. Um, and it can print you this uh, nice uh, output, and also it can print you even nicer output as a form of HTML report, and uh, that report can be somehow automated into be triggered automatically. For example, um, you can have an uh, R, R, an R Studio Connect to, to run this um, like automatically in some in some periods, and maybe you can set your pipeline to I know send this report via email to you. Uh, maybe only in case there are some errors. Uh, maybe you can uh, have your Shiny application that is getting updates from the database, I don't know, every 24 hours. It is doing the quick validation and 
if the data is not passing it, uh, the, the, the data inside the application is not updated. So we are like, keep using the, our old, uh, old values. Um, that package uh, was used in one of the projects in Epsilon and it actually detected uh, in one case that uh, some new uh, employee in the company uh, was putting the discount values into the database. You know, with the discount, it's it's hard to understand, like, is it discount like positive number because it's like a discount or it's a negative number because it's like reducing your price. And that, that person in the company put it like the other way around. So that might cause a huge problem for the, for the uh, application because it would actually like increase price, not decrease them. Um, and it was spotted uh, by the data validator that was uh, put it in that project in particular. So yeah, um, I recommend you to uh, to go take a look. Um, if you find any issues, and you will find issues, uh, put them in the issues, and I promise to take a look on them someday, hopefully, or someone else from Epsilon. Uh, we will we will try to keep this uh, up to date. Okay. Let's move on uh, to some other topics uh, more related to the actual shiny code. So here there is a reactivity, so something very specific for the for the shiny. Some topic that is not kind of something that you can cover with the unit tests. Uh, you can somehow with the front end test, but it's maybe not the way that you would like to do. You would like to test the logic there uh, a little bit simpler uh, than the front end test. So uh, there is a shiny solution that you can actually test your uh, your modules and your lo logic, uh, what is uh, generated in the reactive context. And so here, like just two slides, uh, I recommend you to go to Mastering Shiny uh, book. Um, I won't try to explain this better than Hadley. So um, just for you to see that this is an option and you might want to check this. And in case you would like, you can get the details there. Um, assuming that we have that um, that module that is there. So here, as you can see, there are some output tags with mean, uh, max. There is some reactive about the range of the var that is provided as an argument in that server. Uh, and we are returning the minimum, maximum, and mean uh, here as an output. Very simple module. And we would like to test those uh, with the test server when we provide the X um, as, a, um, as an argument here in the list of arguments. Uh, X is some reactive uh, variable that is created um, here. And th there is like some um, hack here that there is some flash react and it's used to actually update this value here. Again, it's nothing that I came up with it's it's directly from the from the book uh, but my point here um that i would like for you to to remember from this maybe is that in general let's avoid putting uh, a lot of logic into our like shiny reactive layer because it might like first of all uh, until that was possible, it, it wasn't kind of like easy to test this, but also it will create uh, your code to be not so clear. So our recommendation is that you keep your logic in the functions. Um, you might want to actually like package them, that, that, that logic. And in your Shiny applications, you're only dealing with uh, what is behaving, so what to react, how, what to trigger when some action is performed by the user. But then when you're actually like doing something, only the specific function should be triggered and not that there is some massive logic in your, in your uh, Shiny server. Let's try to put it elsewhere. Uh, also, there was some nice discussion in the, in the comments, uh, I think yesterday, uh, during Christian talk about the different types of reactive, reactive values, reactive val, and uh, I think the the point here, uh, the point there was to generally try to avoid 
having everything reactive in your application. Um, one of the reasons why we are also in Epsilon uh, using R6 classes uh, so much is that it keeps the logic inside the class and then you might uh, only trigger things uh, kind of like when you want to do them and not uh, to have everything kind of reactive and observing everything else. Um, so yeah, there is a way to test uh, your um, reactive values here. Uh, here you can also see that it's a little bit like front-end testing because you are testing your out outputs, what will be the values. So that might be some um, equivalent um, and might be something worth trying. In general, unit tests are probably uh, more important. Uh, but here it is. There is a solution. There was a, there was a need for this, and there is an option to do this. Okay, front end tests, and uh, yeah, I a little bit update that uh, slide after yesterday uh, talk. Uh, so yeah, probably the shiny test to it's now your go to solution for the front end test. But I'm um, trusting uh, Barrett here. It's not something that I actually tested and used in practices yet. Uh, definitely I will when I have a chance after the uh, conference to introduce this. So here I can uh, direct you to um, to the GitHub where you can read more. Actually, uh, there is not much there. Um, it proves that this is kind of like a new solution. Uh, I'm sure that it will be uh, developed and more documented later. Uh, just to present you, if you are like not aware what is what it is uh, about, and to <clears throat> if you skip the presentation uh, during that conference, let me use the uh, regular shiny test uh, to explain like what this is about. And this is about recording what you are doing in the application in the front end, and later uh, reusing this. Um, in an automated way when some uh, um, artificial browser is is run in the in the in the background uh, to actually perform the same operations as you did when you were recording the test so the idea is great and shiny test it uh, looks on the paper and from like uh, those um, like hello world examples it looks perfectly you just run the record test, you manually go through the app, you save the scenario, and you can reuse this and you can see differences. The problem is that it never worked for me. Um, I'm interested with uh, your experience, so you might uh, put on the, on the comments, like if you've tried uh, that solution, uh, used to be there like for years, and any time I tried this in a, like real applications, there was something wrong and it wasn't working. It wasn't like capturing the, the scenarios correctly or it was um, it was uh, frozen when you start testing, things like things like this. Um, now with the Shiny Test tool, like there is the very different um, like technical solution uh, underneath, under the hood. And it is uh, promising that it will work much, much better. I think that we will see this in upcoming months when we will all uh, start using this um, extensively. Um, so yeah, uh, we will give this like another try. Uh, our experiences with the regular shiny test was not promising. Uh, that's also why uh, in Epsilon we start using uh, some tools that are not directly connected with shiny. So some JavaScript frameworks. Uh, here is the Cypress. Uh, they are other options. Uh, before, I think we use something that's called Puppet Puppeteer. And uh, you might, some of you might be uh, um, used to working with uh, Selenium. There is a package also R Selenium for doing the front end test. It wasn't easy to work with this, uh, as I as I recall. Cypress, it's easier, but still this is something separated from Shiny R and it requires some JavaScript knowledge and some uh, also like node 
in your project. So this is kind of more advanced. You might take a look, uh, that was probably covered uh, during the Rhino talk a little bit. Um, this is something that worked for us in some projects uh, here in Absalon, so you might be interested. Uh, and definitely uh, we will also give it a try for Shiny test too, as a kind of like Shiny design solution. Okay, so we had our uh, front-end tests. Mm, now the performance testing. And here again, the Shiny low test will be useful. And yeah, I would like to complain this is not something that you should do. And I mean, like this, like lacking the hex sticker. Uh, there should be like a cron check whether you have a hex sticker for your package, because it's really like damaging my concept for the whole uh, layout of the of the application. So there is a shiny load test that you might uh, want to try. That is basically running your application and it's checking if uh, when it is run by multiple users, how it will behave, whether it will react fine uh, for multiple users. Um, David talked a little bit about this uh, earlier today, so I don't want to repeat. Um, this is worth trying, especially when you are like preparing yourself to the production. But again, when you are like just ahead of release, production release, and you run this, that will be like uh, too late already because then you might realize that there are some problems and you might start like refactoring your whole approach or redesigning your uh, assumptions or data architecture there. So definitely like, again, coming back to that slide that I told you to remember from this presentation, you would like to start with this on board and run this early from the very beginning and run this automatically. Um, also to mention, I think that was also covered by, by David, the Provis, so a solution for testing, finding bottlenecks in your application. And this is very useful, uh, especially in Epsilon, we have the cases uh, when, um, a lot of cases when our clients already, they have their application, but it's somehow like not performing well. Uh, there are some issues there. It's uh, it's slugging. Uh, the initialization time is, is super long. They come to us to find out what's the problem. And this is like your starting point to find your bottlenecks and find out what is going on wrong. And I discussed uh, a lot about the code quality and having the clean code and writing the unit test to improve your code. Uh, but before you jump into this, when there is some um, really complex, complex application, you need to know what you should focus on, what is worth refactoring, what will be the biggest gain uh, in the performance time, uh, what to do. So you don't want to spend hours on some function that is like performant. Maybe it's ugly, but it's performant enough and it's not causing any issues for the users. So this is, this is also an excellent package. And I definitely, if you are not familiar with this, uh, try this on your application, try this on your code. It's amazing to play with this uh, graph there. Ah, the Australia, uh, linting. So for the code style, uh, there, is, uh, there is a linter package and we also recommend uh, to have it in your uh, CI, kind of to make sure that um, the code that you're adding is following uh, the styling rules. It's just like for the big teams uh, with multiple developers, when you are uh, combining uh, a lot of uh, codes, a lot of branches, following the same style guide, it's just useful for making uh, the app readable, maintainable. Uh, so follow the same style guide, probably the default one, that like the, the tidyverse, pro I, I think it's used. It's your way to go. Um, also, um, there are some nice features there. For example, there is uh, it's calculating the cyclomatic complexity of your functions. And if you're not aware, um, this is an interesting idea of uh, checking how complex your function is and um, in some kind of like numerical way. 
and this might be really helpful also to spot what places of your application um, are worth refactoring. So another tool to uh, keep your code cleaner, uh, it easier, it will be easier to write tests and things like this. Uh, and Linter is also doing this. So not only like checking if there are like trailing white spaces that will annoy you a lot if you turn this on and your CI will fail because of that, uh, but also it might be useful to, to make, to write a better code, uh, even if the style is okay. Okay, so Australia covered. Uh, okay, uh, so we have our map of tests and kind of we fill this with the solutions. Um, and as I said, for sure there is uh, more things that you can test, uh, for sure, those are not always the only solutions. Probably test that it's it's there uh, with data validator or shiny test. We, we we said that there might be some alternatives that you would like to to try. Um, but basically, this is uh, encapsulating the whole idea. And now um, coming back to that uh, slide. Uh, how to make sure that this is actually implemented in your application. So the problem that we spot in Epsilon, and not only we, as we can say during this, um, this conference, is make, like letting developer uh, to deal with uh, everything and making sure that every aspect of this is incorporated in the project is an overhead. As I mentioned at the very beginning, for the like um, business consulting for Shiny, it's also not not so easy to to say to the client, uh, okay, uh, we will start the project, but now we'll take like two weeks to set up the testing architecture. It's not what we'll do. So you need to kind of like um, make this easy and um, easy to use, fast to implement. But what is the most important to make it uh, that it's not, no one will forget to actually uh, imp implement those various tests in your application. Also, when we are talking about the, the test architecture, it you have to implement, uh, you ha we have to mention the two kind of like approaches that is usually called the testing pyramid. So the thing that you can see, see here and the testing con. And usually it is said that this is uh, the anti-pattern, the testing con, so that the thing that we have like uh, just a few unit tests, more uh, front-end tests, and a lot of manual um, tests, and the, the pattern to follow is like that. Actually, I'm not that strict. I think that there are cases uh, when there is like very little logic uh, to test with unit tests in your application, and actually the con will be fine. So whatever uh, works for your application, I would say. But the point here is probably what is like repeated here multiple times, automated. And this is what, what you would like to make sure that it is there. So if this is con, if this is a pyramid, uh, depending on your case, um, mostly of how my, how much like logic intense is your application and how many actions the user can do on the front end. Um, also, there are like cases when it has to be manually tested. Uh, when we are working for some like pharmaceutical companies, they have all this procedure of how the application is tested and they need to go through all the scenarios and manually clicking through this. And this is kind of like, it is it is uh, required that there's like human eyes watching if everything is fine. Of course, the uh, automated front-end tests are useful there to spot uh, the bugs earlier, but there, there has to be this process. Uh, but what I will, what I would like to highlight here, uh, I put a little nice cloud up there and probably it should be like above all, both of them. So no matter what are, are you are you having, uh, please uh, follow all the guidance that Anna presented like an hour ago. 
uh, with the user sessions and how to conduct them and making sure uh, whether your solution is kind of um, fit for the user needs. So it cannot be done with any tests, automated or not, with any architecture, whether you said this at the beginning of the project or not, this is something that you cannot um, uh, replace. Okay, um, so coming back to that one slide that you should remember, uh, that you start with your testing architecture and it is automated. Um, basically, we can call it uh, CI that you will have set and you can build it your own way. So I'm not uh, telling you how to do this and uh, there are different ways, but remember that it will be much harder to pay your test debt later. So start with this and make this automated. You might use the GitHub template that you will like always start your repository with the same template where it is already there. Uh, you might have some like project checklist and you, when you start your project, you go through this, okay, um, put the architecture for unit tests, uh, add a, a shiny test tool or add a data validator there and, um, and set up like the GitHub actions to be there. Fine, whatever. You can copy paste some of your solutions that you have from the previous projects. Uh, you might have some script to run on project start that you always, always go. You might use some uh, template preparing framework. So uh, we learned today about the Shiny Validator from David. I think this is a really nice approach. I really like that this idea is kind of like um, there. Um, also in the community that this is needed, that we, you would like to have them at the very beginning and that this is important. Um, so yeah. Uh, However you will do this, uh, just uh, make sure that it is there. Okay, I think that's all. Uh, let me know whether you remember that one slide. Hi, Martin. So I have a few questions to you. So you mentioned multiple times that uh, we should start with, ha with having test infrastructure, but you know, in the real world, probably a lot of people will start with just creating a quick prototype without any tests. So would you have any recommendation how to move from this prototype to something that is tested well and is production ready? How to how to move? So we assume that uh, we did not follow the, that, that one no, slide. No, no, no. Of course, we didn't follow the slide. Okay, okay. So <laughs> we had we deadline, would... we had to do something fast. You know, our manager was requesting features. Right now, uh, we need to add this. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, it's about your your mindset. It's about uh, convincing uh, at one um, at some stage of your project that that's 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 enough. You need, we need to do this. Um, you might like repeat this constantly to this manager uh, that is pushing you. At least you will be covered when something is uh, kind of broken. That I told you we need tests. Um, but yeah, it's not that um, that difficult. There are already like tools like like they use this that I presented. So you, you use this. You are it is just adding your know, the folder structure for the test, and you can start uh, writing them. Uh, the later you start, it's um, worse. And I haven't seen probably there are cases when it was like actually that the proof of concept is proof of concept. We make it dirty. And then we just like remove it and we start. And now we will start like a good way. It never happened. You will like constantly in increase and add things to your uh, ugly, dirty proof of concept uh, because you don't want to kind of like waste that time that you spend it there. It's it's what we see in the projects. Uh, so yeah, coming back to that one slide, but uh, if it is not there, just keep pushing for this. And do you have any advice how to convince such manager to uh, allow you to spend some time on testing? Would you recommend, you know, having a full sprint of adding tests or rather, you know, every time you develop a feature, just add this 10% for pay off this technical debt and add tests? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, what is uh, usually working fine? So if you are not having this architecture, uh, you need to dedicate some time to set it up. It's not super long with all those tools. 
but you may might want to find some time when this is actually maybe some less busy period uh, maybe some like um long weekend approaching on there is or there is some like uh, steady time before christmas that you can actually do this um and once it is there uh yeah i don't believe in like some this week we will do the tests because later you will like stop doing them it's much better to build this habit of actually adding this uh, if you are having a big test debt you might start with something like okay for each new feature that we will implement we will create we will add the tests okay the old ones they are not tested maybe we will add like a little bit uh, for them uh, one by one and what is also useful in that case um github you can have uh, pull request templates where you can have like a checklist and you might add this point like did you add your tests and check it and uh, you, you cannot merge without like checking this okay i added it won't write the test for you but at least you will feel guilty when okay yet again i need to merge this without tests but next time maybe you will and maybe this will remind you and maybe will this will uh, keep showing you that you are having and you are collecting and you are increasing the test debt Great, thanks. I have to say that in projects that I was involved in, also this idea of just, you know, having this step by step in every sprint doing something and when you build a new feature, uh, adding tests or when you touch the old feature because you have to mm. replace something, you know, adding tests. This is something that usually works probably the best. Yeah, especially when you want to refactor the code. So yeah. uh, what management is uh, willing to accept is that there are some performance issues. OK, so that feature is, is working slowly let's rebuild it that it is uh, faster and this is a perfect um, opportunity uh, to uh, to write a test because like you need to start and make sure you need to start with tests and make sure that uh, you won't uh, break any behavior and logic once you're refactoring this to make faster uh, so this is actually a perfect uh, time to convince uh, the client the manager uh, we we need to build a test for that and also it will be useful for all the other features yeah because also it's understandable that someone won't pause the development for for a month and tell you okay yeah please <laughs> correct the code <laughs> right there is always uh, some need so maybe one more question because i know probably it's hard to answer for a question like what is the right amount of tests because it's probably depends mm. but have you seen some things that are usually omitted so some parts of the app that you would say, you know, they, they, they need testing and they are not tested. So in general, like what would you, um, what parts would you pay uh, attention to um, mm -hmm. working on this? Uh, yeah, so the data, uh, as I mentioned, it's something that you usually omit and uh, your application works fine. And maybe you can blame like the other team that is preparing data in the database. Uh, but yeah, at the end, uh, you, we are all working together to bring the great application for our users. And the data and uh, also what uh, we saw often that, yeah, there is a lot of logic in this um, reactive parts of the application. And it's not so easy to test through the unit test. Now we have the mm -hmm. solutions thanks to this um, test server uh, things. But still, it's uh, not that obvious. Um, and it requires some like, at, at least that you've heard about this. It's easier that you've heard about unit tests and you maybe you are building your unit test. But OK, this part I'm not touching because this is like inside of the reactive. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to do this. So those parts are omitted. Um, so yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I don't see any more questions here. Uh, so let's again take a six minutes break and then we'll continue with presentation from uh, Pedro. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, so uh, the next and last presentation will be a presentation from Pedro. In a moment. Uh, so Pedro is well known from building beautiful and unusual shiny applications. So today he will be talking about how to make your dashboard stand out. Um, yeah, I will leave you with Pedro. Uh, thank you, Maria. So uh, welcome to this uh, final part of our uh, masterclass. Um, so we went through testing, we went 
through a lot of topics when it comes to building Shiny applications. Uh, today, I wanted to talk to you a bit more about the, the visual part, about how your users actually use your dashboard, what they see, uh, how, how it behaves. Uh, and in general, to kind of give you some some ideas, some tips, some some knowledge transfer of uh, all the things that are uh, currently out there that you can that you can leverage for this. Um, just quick information about me uh, for those who don't know me. Uh, I've been a shiny developer for uh, past four years. Before that, I used to uh, be very involved in web development, uh, websites, apps, that kind of stuff. Uh, and I've recently also started uh, getting my feet wet in uh, actual package development, so open source. So I currently already have uh, two packages on CRAN. Um, you can find me, uh, connect with me in any of these uh, social networks if you want. Uh, and you can find a lot of my work in my personal website if you're interested. So what are the actual goals for, for this presentation. Um, so uh, the idea is not to go from zero to 100 right away. Uh, I kind of want to give you some, some middle, uh, middle states that you can kind of leverage to add more and more, uh, to, to make your dashboard stand out more and more uh, when it comes to, to actually making things a bit more appealing. And hopefully by the end, you, you'll have uh, enough information that you can do uh, really out of the box stuff, uh, or at least have some idea of how you could get this uh, to this state. Uh, so maybe just a bit of motivation first, why does this actually matter? Why, why is standing out? Why, why is it that uh, having uh, outstanding and standing out from normal shiny dashboards is important? Well, the truth is that uh, the way your application looks and responds is is usually the first point of contact that your users have. So you want to kind of hook them in from the beginning. That's why standing out is so important, uh, especially uh, maybe not for when you're building for yourself or for a uh, specific functionality, uh, but even in large uh, enterprises, you're sometimes fighting just for for the to actually have someone use your application. So standing out is usually a really good way of uh, getting people to share your application, uh, getting it to, to reach the right people, get, getting people uh, actually using the application. Uh, and the truth is that most users don't know and very often don't care what's actually in the back end of your application. Uh, they kind of just care about what they see and how it feels. So a lot of this will will kind of involve um, the actual UI and the behavior of the application. Uh, and finally, your users, uh, ideally, you make them feel engaged and comfortable when they visit your application. Uh, the truth is that uh, at the end of the day, frustration can really be the difference between success and failure when it comes to some applications. Um, and you might have been expecting this, but usually this, this set of rules, techniques, ideas is usually referred to the UI UX of the application. And that's uh, more or less what we're going to be focusing on today. So before getting into the actual meat of the presentation, I think it's also um, useful to kind of share what the UI UX process looks like. So even before you start coding, uh, before you start testing stuff, stuff out, building POCs, uh, there's usually a full process that goes into creating what what ultimately becomes the the UI and the UX of of a specific pro project. Uh, very often, this is not something that is done by you. So you you get you get a task, you need to implement it, uh, you need to build a dashboard. Other people did this for you, ideally, especially when it's it's very big projects. But as as shiny developers, very often uh, we're kind of on our own, and uh, it's important to know that there are things that you can do before you even start coding. Uh, there's a lot of steps that you can take to kind of make sure that you have all the information and everything ready to uh, develop faster, stronger, better. Uh, 
we won't really cover the whole process, uh, but I think uh, Anya also mentioned, and I think structuring and prototyping are two very important uh, parts of this process. And honestly, it's it's super easy to to try something out. Uh, before you start coding, just grab some piece of paper, just doodle a bit, uh, maybe open Figma, PowerPoint, whatever you're actually familiar and uh, know how to use very well and just try to make some mockups. Uh, this this will help a lot during development. Uh, it helps you structure things. It helps you turn uh, functionalities and things that you actually need to implement into actionable points. Small things lets you build a backlog. There's a lot of uh, nice information that you can get just from building pen and paper uh, prototypes. Um, also, Still before the coding and more in the wave of this this actual um, UI and UX uh, line of, of thinking, there's there's a few simple rules that um, if you keep them in mind, really help when building the application. And I've narrowed it down to uh, six things that I always try to keep in mind when, when I'm developing applications. Uh, the first one is to keep things simple. So if you don't need that button, don't add that button. Uh, try to make only the bare uh, necessary elements in your application. Uh, make sure that they all kind of look the same. If, if you have multiple ways of triggering a functionality, try to find some common language between them. Uh, this really helps users. And of course, the best interfaces are almost invisible to the user. Uh, this is also something that's uh, it's good to keep in mind. Uh, whenever, uh, I think this is a very, a very uh, programmer thing to say, but whenever you do something right, uh, no one noticed. Uh, whenever you do something wrong, everyone noticed. And this is exactly the same for, for your UI. Uh, if everything is as expected, there shouldn't be any problems. Uh, the, the second one is to be consistent. So try to reuse elements a lot. Uh, if you have an input somewhere, try to make sure that all the inputs look similar. Uh, reuse, uh, encapsulate, build functions for, for your custom components. Uh, and if you can try to create these patterns in your, in your structure and your language, uh, try to build things that are consistent. Um, don't let users second guess what a button might do. Uh, especially when there's a different button that that's already uh, somewhere else in the app that is going to do exactly the same. Just make them similar, uh, as, as similar as you can. Uh, the third one is about layouting. So layouting is, isn't usually something that we think too much about, but it, it's a very powerful uh, tool technique that you can also use. Uh, you can play around with spacing. Uh, you can create structures based on, on import, importance. Uh, you can even get users to focus on specific parts of your application simply by having uh, a nice layout and by giving importance to some, th some things more than others. And another one is also uh, remember that everything that is on the screen is something that you can use. So things like color, texture, topography. These are all tools that you have that you have on your arsenal to kind of improve and make your dashboards even stand out more. Uh, use them, use more faded col uh, colors for fonts that you don't want people to fo focus on so much. Uh, use bold fonts for things that are really important. Uh, remember that different fonts send different messages. Uh, things like size, uh, um, size, the, even the actual type of font, all of these send a specific type of message and make users feel in a different way when, when they're using your application. Uh, one more, which is very, very important, I think for me, is uh, make sure that your users know what's happening. Uh, don't let them second guess if, if the app broke, if, if it's in a failed state. Uh, just have a message somewhere. Uh, always. Make sure that they know 
what's happening, when it's happening. Uh, and even if you have very long uh, processes that you're going through, there's ways of kind of making users feel like they're achieving something. So progress bars uh, are a really good way, but also things like next steps. Uh, so try if you have a very long process, breaking it down into small chunks and have the user go to step one, step two, step three. This is much less daunting than having 100 steps all at once. Uh, so this is also something that can really improve the, the experience of the users. And finally, uh, think about the default. So when you're building your application, uh, you have an idea of what users are going to be doing there. So things like having your text fields already pre-filled with some text or having some checkbox selected or not, all of these can be uh, really, really good, make, make your user's life much easier. Uh, but also th these are, even if you don't know these in the beginning, uh, if you are going through user testing, if you are going through uh, user stories, you can get a lot of information from those and fill in your inputs and your defaults uh, right from the beginning. Yeah, so these are my six rules to kind of uh, always keep in the back of, of my mind whenever I'm uh, doing anything related to, to building a completely new dashboard. Uh, I hope it helps. And one last thing that I will say is remember that there is a whole R community. There's, there's a whole Chinese community out there. Uh, if you're looking for a specific functionality, a specific component, it's possible that it even already exists. Or if it doesn't, there's a lot of people that will be willing to help you. So remember to leverage the community whenever you, you need. Uh, I definitely recommend going through CRAN. Uh, there's there's a, a nice index of all the packages that are uh, available. And with a quick search on the browser, maybe you can find exactly what you want. Uh, but I also left here two um, collections on GitHub of a lot of different packages, especially related to Shiny. Uh, these include packages for components, packages for layouts, packages for UI. Uh, I will use some of the examples uh, that, that they, they mention here, but they're a very good start if you're just looking for something specific. So with all of this in mind, and knowing that uh, you might not always be able to use, to go through the entire process, and kind of uh, figure out exactly uh, all these things before you actually start developing. Uh, is there something that we can focus on when uh, as a, as a, as a developer? And yes, I think there's three main areas that whenever you're developing your application, you can kind of look at. Uh, so how the application looks in a general way, how it's structured, so the layout itself, and how it behaves. Uh, these are three main areas that we can do a lot with not only with what we have, but also with all the techniques that I'll be talking about here. And all of these are things that um, even just thinking about them a bit and doing some tweaks is already a massive multiplier to, to the way uh, your dashboard looks and behaves. And uh, I know that the shiny iceberg is very, very deep. Uh, I, I, I understand that jumping uh, to uh, completely um, custom solutions, it's it's not always possible. Uh, maybe you're just starting as a Shiny developer. Maybe you want to kind of get your feet wet in some things. But it's it's important to know that from the very tip and just using base Shiny, there's already a lot of stuff that you can do. And you can kind of go lower and lower uh, as, as you feel comfortable and try to add more and more to your Shiny dashboard. So regarding how, so just, I will be structuring this bit on these three areas. So first we'll be talking a bit about how you can affect the way the dashboard looks, uh, then how it's structured and finally how it behaves. Uh, and I will try to give you some solutions that go deeper and deeper into the, the iceberg so that you don't feel uh, overwhelmed. Uh, you can always find something that suits your needs. So. The way it looks. So uh, 
it makes sense that we kind of start with base shiny and all of the base shiny components. So some tips here are that there's a lot of uh, inputs, a lot of elements that kind of get bu bundled in with Shiny that can really affect the way uh, you your dashboards look. Get familiar with these. There's there's a lot of settings, even for a simple button, that can completely change the way the button looks. Um, the best way to do this is explore the documentation. If, if you're using an action button, uh, just press F2 in your ID and try to see what other options the, the button actually has. Uh, and finally, remember that just a tiny bit of CSS can go a long way, uh, even to to add to these basic widgets. Uh, you don't need to get too deep into it. We had some very good talks uh, during this conference about CSS. I won't get too deep into it, but uh, remember, remember that uh, just a tiny bit sometimes is usually enough. Just a different border, maybe a different font. Uh, all of these things can really uh, make you stand out. Uh, the second thing is additional packages. So a lot of the things that we want to build are out there already. Uh, so remember that you don't need to do everything from scratch. Uh, explore a bit when it comes to, to uh, additional widgets, additional components that you can use in your Shiny, Shiny dashboard. Uh, I left here some of my favorites. Of course, there's there's a lot more. Uh, uh, I definitely recommend things like eCharts, for example, for um, all sorts of different charts. They have some really crazy stuff out there. Uh, leaflet for maps can be extremely powerful. Tables, there's also a lot of different solutions for tables. Uh, some of them might have exactly the functionality that, that you need already built in. So really explore a bit before committing to a specific widget for a specific functionality. And when you know that you're going to need a specific um, functionality that might be out there and the, your choice might, might not have support for it. Uh, finally, how as we go deeper, uh, you might want to start looking into uh, UI packages. So UI packages are packages that aim to replace the base components of of Shiny or even augmented with a few different components. Uh, some of my favorite ones on, on the left, uh, Semantic, Fluent, Bulma, the, these are all packages that offer you uh, either the same components that you have in base Shiny or the same components and maybe a few more. There, there's a lot of packages that uh, take an input and just give it a different style. Uh, a lot of these are based on uh, different web frameworks that have already been wrapped. But the, the cool thing about our packages is that uh, it's already been wrapped. So you, you don't really need to worry about it too much. And this also kind of lets you skip uh, some of those steps for UI UX development that uh, I mentioned in the beginning, because someone already did it. So you can you can always use it uh, and be sure that it was built uh, with a lot of those usability uh, metrics in mind. Um, and it's something that is very easy to plug and play usually and just switch to, to a different, to a different uh, UI package. Uh, and another thing that is very important to keep in mind are theming packages. So uh, a lot of these, a, a lot of these uh, packages that a lot of these UI packages uh, come with a specific style, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's the only style that they offer. Uh, very, very often you have plugins and you have uh, additional packages that end up changing the way those UI packages uh, behave by default. Um, I think BSLib is the big standout here. Um, it works with Base Shiny directly, but lets you completely change the way they look. So a big shout out here to BSLib. Uh, it's super easy to use. The theme demo is the, the theme customizer is uh, a really nice, a really nice tool to kind of let you generate a theme exactly how you want. And uh, especially if you if you just want to kind of spice it up a bit or maybe add your company colors, uh, maybe start playing around with changing the design a bit. This can be a very easy way to uh, 
completely change the way your your base shiny dashboard looks like. Uh, and finally, as we go a bit more deeper into the to the iceberg of how it looks, uh, you might want to look into uh, complementary um, uh, technologies and languages. So CSS is the big the big one. Uh, you can use this at any level with any UI package, with any theming uh, library, with any widget. Well, most widget uh, packages. There's always a use to add a bit of CSS if you're looking for uh, to, to change some details. Uh, it can be as simple as changing the font because a widget is using a different font that your your dashboard isn't. Uh, but it can also be related to colors, to a lot of stuff. Um, there's, it's super easy to add. Uh, you can make it as simple or as complicated as you want. So you can always add this directly to uh, any any UI element that you create. Uh, you can add these generally to the top of your UI definitions. Or if you're looking for uh, to build a lot of CSS, I definitely recommend building these as uh, separate files and just linking them in your UI. And finally, as things get a bit more and more complex when it comes to custom styling, uh, I would say that looking into solutions uh, like SAS, so things that let you organize a lot of CSS in uh, a more clean way uh, is also something that you can look into. So uh, for those of you that don't know, SAS is basically just a preprocessor to CSS. So running a SAS function or running a, a, a SAS process will always compile a lot of uh, all the styles written in SAS into a CSS file, which you can then add to your to your application. Uh, but it's more of a programmer approach to styling. So there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that you don't have in uh, in base C CSS uh, and the Great thing about this is that there's there's libraries. There, there's already a library in R that lets you use SAS super easily. So I definitely recommend looking into it uh, as, as you start writing more and more custom styling. Uh, just to give you a very small overview, uh, it allows nesting. So you end up writing less. It lets you use variables directly from R if, if you want, uh, and it kind of, lets you build your own style structure so you can split your css into a lot of separate files that do uh that, that end up styling just a very specific part of your ui or that have different functions because part of it is for the layout part of it is for the the, um, the actual components so there's it's very very powerful and it's uh, i i would put it in the very bottom of the iceberg when it comes to to customizing the way your, your dashboards look. Mm. So the second thing I mentioned was about the structure. So what do I mean by structure? So structure is basically how do you lay out your different elements uh, in, your, in your Shiny application? Um, you can think of this as the template of, of your of your application, if if there was no if there was no inputs there, if there was only slots where you wanted to put things, you can kind of think of this as your layout. Um, this this can be extremely powerful, and again, just like how uh, just like how changing the way the the actual components look, there's uh, very shallow and very deep ways that you can approach this. So. To give you like an idea of what I'm talking about, if, if we look at our old Faithful Geyser uh, uh, app, uh, Shiny application, you can kind of already see that there's three main areas in this layout. So we have a header, we have a sidebar, we have a main area. Uh, all of these are things that you can end up changing. And just like before, um, we can start at the very top. So Base Shiny already offers you uh, quite a bit of um, uh, quite a few different functions that let you create these these layouts. Um, well, not these layouts, but a lot of different layouts. Uh, these are more or less just functions that have specific arguments, and you can fill them in with different things. 
but there's also uh, if you have been dabbling a bit more in custom custom layouts, you might have stumbled upon fluid row and columns that are also bundled in with Shiny. Uh, I think yesterday there was also a talk about design systems where it was mentioned that Shiny is based on Bootstrap, which has a 12 column grid, which means that even though you do have some flexibility here, because you can define uh, different rows and how many columns uh, that row has and what space in the what's the number of columns in this 12 column grid that that specific uh, col part of the layout is going to, to use, uh, you're still stuck with this 12 column uh, layout. So you won't be able to do like a, a four and a half with column or uh, to kind of make something that is a bit more unusual. Uh, but it is a very good way to get your, your feet wet when it comes to layout. Uh, I, it is worth mentioning that different UI packages usually have different layout systems. So uh, an example here is Semantic, for example, doesn't use a 12 column layout, uses a 16 column layout. Uh, Shiny Mobile also has its own way of specifying how big the, the different components are. Mostly, I just want you to keep in mind that as you switch, as you try out different UI um, UI packages, you might end up with not being able to use fluid rows, columns, uh, because there's its own system. So do pay attention to this. As always, documentation is very much your friend when it comes to this, these things. Uh, large list of different packages that uh, kind of give you different systems to build these. Uh, I will share all of this in the end. These are just some of the ones that I'm aware of. I'm sure there's a lot more uh, when it comes to this. And finally, when it comes to custom layouts, uh, I will also like to plug in my own uh, package. So Imolo, which is basically uh, kind of a middleware between using pure CSS um, and using these very more rigid layouts when it comes to how many how many columns what kind of uh, rows and columns you can create so uh, the idea of imol is basically that you should be able to generate um different grids based on css directly in r so here's our old faithful geyser uh, but rebuilt in uh in uh in imola it's i think it's a very good way to kind of get your first bearings when it comes to CSS grid and flex. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, I definitely recommend looking into, into it. And grid especially can be extremely powerful. So uh, no matter how complex your layouts are, I'm sure you can find a way of uh, setting them up. Uh, yeah, and just, just a small summary. So this is basically, if you're familiar with CSS grid and flex, this is basically just a uh, uh, an, an R uh, interface to kind of build these. Uh, it also has a few a uh, few other systems. So these these uh, um, template th there's templates there's break breakpoint systems if you if you want to have your shiny applications be responsible uh, for different screen sizes and of course you do need to get your feet wet a bit in CSS but uh, it tries to abstract as much as possible. Uh, finally, as we get to the bottom of, of the iceberg, uh, you can build just fully custom uh, custom HTML, pure custom HTML and CSS templates. And here, I definitely recommend looking into HTML tools. Uh, I definitely fell in love with HTML templates uh, function before. It's it's a very good way if you're if you have a CS, uh, an HTML template that you just kind of want to fill in. Or if you if you found a really good example and before doing the whole conversion from HTML to R, kind of just want to check if it actually does what you want, uh, make sure that uh, just test it out with HTML templates. So HTML template can take, can take either an HTML string or a file, and it has this idea that you can kind of define a few a few holes similar to glue with these double curly brackets and then just fill it in with whatever shiny components you want.
finally, uh, our third area that we can kind of uh, influence Shiny a bit is how it behaves. Uh, so for behavior, there's already a lot of packages that you can you can uh, use that kind of wrap specific behaviors. So again, if you're looking for a very specific situation, uh, it, it's always worth do a, a Google search just in case uh, someone already did it. There's things like Shiny JS that also give you a bit more uh, general solutions to, to add behavior. And there's things like page map R, which is, I don't know, I, I, I recently found this one and uh, it's it's a very interesting, it creates like a small minimap kind of like the, the IDs have for very long files, but it actually does this for your application. Uh, and also things like uh, user input. So keys is a very, a very nice library that lets you listen to what keys your user is actually pressing and kind of create shortcuts, for example, for, for different functionalities of your application, because it's just, it's just another event that you can you can observe from the server side. Uh, as we go a bit deeper, uh, I think it's also worth mentioning that uh, if you are building your own uh, your own behavior, uh, there's so when we're talking about more like web technology, uh, CSS and JavaScript of course, always always come to mind. Uh, it is worth mentioning that both of them kind of let you add behavior. Uh, CSS might not let you add uh, as much custom behavior as JavaScript, but it does let you uh, at least change a few things. And a few examples of these are those, those very simple micro interactions. Uh, you can build these in CSS directly without actually having to to rely on, on JavaScript. Um, this is good not only because uh, JavaScript is heavier than CSS, but also because it's it's just simpler. So one thing that you can definitely look into is uh, pseudo, uh, pseudo classes, pseudo selectors for, for CSS. These basically uh, let you create rules for specific states of, of an element. So in this case, uh, hover, for example, will only activate a specific CSS rule if that element is being hovered by the mouse. Uh, there's others, so things like focus, for example, is very nice for, for inputs uh, and active, which is like that very small moment when the user clicked the button but didn't release yet. Uh, maybe maybe you want to add a tiny bit of, of, um, of zest here. Um, Moving on from from CSS and more into into JavaScript, there is of course uh, a lot you can do with JavaScript. Uh, Base Shiny does give you uh, some some scaffolding to kind of build these. So I'm talking about custom messages. So custom messages are something that's built into Shiny of how you can actually invoke uh, of how you can invoke um, JS functions. So uh, there's basically Two, type, two things you can do. So you can go from the server to the browser or from the browser to the server. Both of these have like a very simple workflow. Uh, so uh, I'm giving you both recipes here. So if you're going from Shiny to the browser, uh, you, you're gonna wanna look into uh, session dollar sign send, send custom message. Uh, this basically lets you uh, send something to the browser and on the browser, you define a custom message handler that kind of catches that custom message and calls a specific JavaScript function. And here you can do whatever you want. So uh, basically anything inside of this uh, JS function is something that you can, you can now trigger directly from your server whenever you want, because you have an observer that uh, triggers it. And of course the other way around. So uh, you can use shiny.setInputValue uh, as a way to from your JavaScript trigger an actual update on an input on, on the Shiny side. Uh, so here, for example, you can, uh, it's a very simple function. So anywhere in your script, you can give it an ID for, for an input, the message that you want to send. And this just becomes an input 
that's available uh, to observe from, from the shiny side. Mm. So we know the communication part, but how do we actually do these? And this is where knowing a bit more about JavaScript kind of becomes more and more important. Uh, so I won't go very deep into uh, how different things in JavaScript can be done, uh, but I would like to give a honorable mention here to jQuery. Uh, I know that usually people aren't very keen on learning jQuery, but uh, or on using jQuery because uh, most of the things you can do in jQuery you can do in base shiny, uh, in base uh, JavaScript. But I think as a, as an introduction um, syntax for JavaScript, it's it's extremely useful. Uh, it has a very simple way of selecting elements, and it already comes with a lot of built-in events that you can just fill in with a tiny bit of additional code. Uh, and it has the advantage that it comes already built in with Shiny. So this is a dependency that uh, you always get in your Shiny application because part of Shiny is actually built using jQuery. So uh, it's not like you're going to add any additional dependencies. It's, it's just something that's already there. Uh, yeah, and uh, just, just a, a quick note on how you can actually add your your js code to, to your shiny applications so in your ui you can always link uh using a tag a, a, a script tag to a file that you have in your www folder this will be attached to your your shiny application and run whatever code you have there so if you if you want to define those custom message handlers uh you can just add a file here put that code there and then just link it in your ui and now it gets uh, it gets uh, loaded whenever your Shiny application um, starts. And a bit more deep, so uh, there is also the the, um, the possibility that you are either looking for uh, so as as you start looking into JavaScript, and you might notice that there's a lot of of packages out there. So there's a lot of uh, libraries in, in JavaScript itself that aren't wrapped for uh, Shiny and for R yet. Um, if you get to this point, uh, I definitely recommend looking into HTML widgets. It might seem, it might sound like it takes a lot of JavaScript knowledge to do this, uh, but do not be worried. A HTML widgets gives you a very uh, pain-free way of kind of wrapping some of these uh, packages. And it's if you need any any further proof, a lot of of um, of the packages that you might already be using uh, are using HTML widgets, widgets underneath. So things like iCharters, React Table, eCharts, Leaflet, uh, you name them. Uh, there's there's a very high chance that they were actually built using HTML widgets. Okay, and just to kind of reiterate in our uh, iceberg of of shiny. No matter which level you're at, uh, always rem remember that you can go a tiny bit deeper. But always remember, but also remember that uh, as you are in a specific level, uh, you might want to give back to the community by going a bit up. So everything that uh, you learn along the way doesn't get lost. Uh, sometimes it even makes development a bit faster. So you don't always need to go straight into the, the, the crazy stuff. Uh, sometimes it's enough to just add a bit, uh, add a different team or switch the UI library. And this is enough to already give you uh, a very nice, uh, a very nice change when it comes to, to base shine. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to leave you with some examples. So uh, this is something that we built using semantic, for example, but that ends up being styled a bit. So it's not base. Semant shiny semantic, but it does use shiny semantic, which then gets uh, changed a bit. Uh, the example that I gave you before that kind of goes through all the, these states, this is actually a blog post that uh, we, we created some time ago. So it goes all the way from base shiny to a tiny bit of style to using uh, shiny dashboard, uh, semantic dashboard, and then actual full custom styles uh, craziness. Uh, I also invite you to check out our demos page. It has a lot of dashboards that we build uh, 
over the years. And if you're looking for inspiration or some some ideas, there's there's a lot of stuff there. And of course, I also invite you to uh, check out my previous submissions from the Shiny Contest. So Shiny Decisions, this was, uh, it, the full code is available. So as you go, if you really want, you can dive deep into how a lot of this stuff gets used. Uh, I, I will say that it does use an existing CSS framework. So it also showcases a bit how you can build those custom uh, HTML structures to uh, leverage stuff that's already out there. And I think that's it from my side. Thank you. Uh, oh, uh, one final thing. There's a lot of references. I don't know if this got shared already, but uh, all these links, all of these slides will also be shared. Uh, and especially those um, shiny collections that I was mentioning you, there's hundreds of examples there. So uh, I'm sure you can find something to play around with. Thanks, Pedro. You just answered the first question because some people asked if the presentation will be shared. Uh, so I have another question. Uh, would Imola be compatible with shiny dashboard uh, boxes? Uh, so I wouldn't see why not. Uh, so just a bit of background on what Imola actually is. It's just a div with a specific piece of CSS attached to it. So if you can put a div there, you can definitely use Imola. Okay, great. This is great news. Uh, another question I have to you, imagine that you are in a dream world and you can, you know, with a snip of your fingers, create some package. So today you mentioned a lot of wonderful packages, but what do you feel is missing? What would you like to have uh, created for Shiny? Is there anything like this? Uh, it, it's it's fairly hard. Uh, mm. it's, there's, there's a lot of stuff. I, I think I'm also a bit biased coming from web development, uh, a lot of the stuff that I was used to uh, doesn't really have wrappers for R. So I would I would probably say that maybe not one specific package, but I'm always excited when another UI package shows up. Uh, so if you're out there and you have a really nice CSS framework that you want to use with, with Shiny, uh, just wrap it and link it to me and I would be happy to use it. A variety is always the best. Okay, so you already asked, asked some other questions that I had, uh, but maybe some other places that you take in inspiration for uh, a design. So when you start working, uh, I'm a very big fan of uh, Data is Beautiful on Reddit. So r slash Data is Beautiful is a like a part of my daily routine. To kind of uh, just I usually just save them for a rainy day, uh, but also things like. Uh, Sometimes it, it's not even about the dashboard. It's also about uh, the colors or the, the the feeling of the dashboard. Uh, I very often browse uh, deviant art or just artwork, uh, and just find like cool color palettes and that kind of stuff. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Let me quickly see if there is any new questions. I don't see any. Uh, Jordan is just saying that he's a very big fan of you. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, Pedro. Uh, do we still have Anya and Martin with us just to say goodbye? I'm not sure. Yeah, we have Martin, we have Anya. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, all of you. And uh, to anyone who will have any more questions, I'm sure that you can reach to Pedro, Anya and Martin. Uh, so maybe you can just tell us uh, what is the, um, like how, how people can uh, contact with you. For sure, through Epsilon, like you see links there, but maybe on LinkedIn, some other uh, places. Pedro. Uh, so you can find me on all the typical social networks. So Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, yeah, that, that's actually it. Anya. Uh, yeah, I'm not very active on Twitter, so preferably LinkedIn. And Martin. Um, yeah. Everywhere, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, even. Okay. That's fair. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it won't be hard, probably. Again, thank you so much. And uh, I think we can conclude this session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.